Good afternoon and welcome to the New York City Council Committee on Rules, Privileges and Elections. My name is Brad Lander. I'm the chair of the committee. We're joined today uh, by a couple of committee members at the start. Thank you to Minority Leader Steve Matteo and Council Member Dan Goradnik. And I know some other members uh, are at another hearing and will be over shortly. Um, we thanks also to our council, Elizabeth Guzman, and to the Cracker Jack staff of our investigative unit at the council, Chuck Davis, Alicia Vassell, and Andre Johnson Brown. Today, the council will consider the reappointment of Dr. Robert L. Bobby Cohen uh, to the New York City Board of Correction. Dr. Cohen has served as a member of the board appointed by this council since 2009. Uh, if reappointed by the council, Dr. Cohen, who's a resident of Manhattan, will serve on the Board of Corrections for a new six-year term to begin on October 13, 2017 and expire on October 12, 2020. Um, as I think people know, the New York City Department of Correction provides for the care, custody, and control of people who are accused or convicted of crimes and sentenced to one year or less of jail time. The department manages 15 facilities, 10 of which uh, are on Rikers Island, though many of us are working hard to make that not the case. Um, uh, the department handles more than 100,000 admissions each year and manages an average daily inmate population of approximately 14,000. The New York City Board of Corrections oversees the department's operations and evaluates the agency's performance. By law, the Board of Corrections or its members have the power and duty to inspect and visit all institutions and facilities under the jurisdiction of the department, evaluate the department's performance, establish minimum standards, and establish procedures for the hearing of grievances and complaints. The board is, uh, while, the, while the commissioner of the Department of Corrections is appointed, as I think people here know, uh, by the mayor, as that's been in the news recently, uh, the board is made up of nine members, three appointed by the mayor, three appointed by the council, and three appointed by the mayor on the nomination jointly by the presiding justices of the appellate division of the Supreme Court for the first and second judicial districts. Members are appointed for a term of six years, and vacancies are filled for the remainder of an unexpired term. The mayor designates the chair from amongst its members. Board members do not receive compensation, but they can be reimbursed for expenses incurred during the performance of their duties. This term in this council, uh, we appointed uh, Stanley Richards, who's here uh, with us in the chamber today. Um, Dr. Cohen's uh, original term was uh, nominated and passed in the prior term of the council. Uh, so we haven't seen him before this uh, committee before, but he has continued to stay in touch with us and keep us posted as the council's, one of the council's three representatives on the board. Uh, so Dr. Cohen, we're, we're very pleased to have you here today. Um, let me ask that you raise your right hand to be sworn or affirmed in. Good afternoon, Dr. Cohen. Good afternoon. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Um, Rules Committee members, as normal, you can find a written copy of uh, uh, the Dr. Dr. Cohen's opening statement as well as the background research done by our staff in advance. Um, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, um, members of the City Council, and good afternoon. My name is Bobby Cohen. I'm here to request your support for my reappointment as one of the three City Council representatives on the New York City Board of Correction. I've served in this position for eight years and hope you will recommend me for another term. I was born in the Bronx. I attended public schools in Queens and graduated from, Princeton Uni from Bayside High School. I attended Princeton University and Rush Medical College in Chicago. I completed my residency and chief residency in internal medicine at Cook County Hospital. While in Chicago, I did research on the epidemiology of epilepsy in the Illinois prison system. I returned to New York City in 1981 to serve as the chief physician at EMTC, one of the jails on Rikers Island. In 1982, I was appointed director of the Montefiore Rikers Island Health Services. I worked each day on Rikers Island until the fall of 1986 when I became the vice president for medical operations of the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation. After leaving Health and Hospitals in 1988, I started a clinical practice in general internal medicine in Manhattan. And in 1989, I was appointed as the director of the St. Vincent's Hospital AIDS Center. I have been appointed by federal judges in Florida, New York State, Connecticut, Michigan, and Ohio to monitor and improve clinical services for prisoners who have been denied access to basic medical care. I served for 17 years as a board member of the National Commission on Correctional Health Care, 
representing the American Public Health Association. The board of the National Commission is made up of 36 representatives of national health, of national health care, legal, and correctional organizations, including the American Sheriff's Association, the American Medical Association, American Nurses Association, the American Psychiatric Association, the American Jail Association, and the American Dental Association. The National Commission creates standards for health care in prisons and jails and accredits them. In New York, I served for 17 years as a member of the board of the Fortune Society. I live in Manhattan, and my two children attended New York City public schools through their high school graduation. I've worked in and around New York City jails for more than 35 years. I was honored to have the opportunity to work on Rikers Island daily for five years. Although the city jails have always been violent, they have also been a national model for medical care, mental health care, drug use services, and civilian oversight. I bring more than 35 years of direct experience providing, providing, administering, and monitoring medical and mental health services in jails and prisons throughout the United States. I visit the jails regularly, almost monthly, sometimes several times per month, on behalf of the Board of Correction and the City Council. We are concerned about the safety of all who work and live in the jails. We need to obtain available technology, particularly body scanners, to find and remove weapons from the jails. We need to decrease the use of, torturous, of the torturous practice of prolonged solitary confinement because it is inhumane, does not improve behavior, and increases violence in the jails. It is important to me that New York City's jails represent the values that are in the city charter, which create and support the Board of Correction. The Board establishes minimum standards for the care, custody, correction, treatment, supervision, and discipline of all persons held or confined under the jurisdiction of the Department of Correction. I believe that this is a critical function, and I believe that the board and those who work and live in the jails benefit from my expertise. I thank you for the opportunity to print this opening statement. Dr. Cohen, thank you for that opening statement, and just thank you even more for your service. I just want to say I feel very proud as a member of this council that you represent us on the Board of Corrections. I think people can see from your opening statement, but even more if they have a chance to dig in and look at your resume and your materials here in the book. I mean, for someone with your uh, medical education and your track record, obviously, you could be in, you know, you could have had a career in private practice making a whole lot of money, and the fact that you dedicated yourself to uh, to prison health, and then even beyond that to oversight um, with no compensation is a, is a real testimony. And, I, you know, to me, it's just I'll call people to the first uh, sentence in your pre-hearing questions. So when we ask why are you interested in continuing to serve on the board, this belief that civilian oversight of jails and prisons is an essential component of a democratic society uh, is, is powerful, and um, I think we're lucky to, to have had you there. And I know um, folks can look at the, the press clips here and see that there have been many times when you have been unafraid to speak up uh, and say something that the department, you know, was not as enthusiastic, or City Hall, or the mayor, or the corrections commissioner, whoever, was not necessarily enthusiastic to hear. Um, and that's what we, that's the job, that's, that's why we have these positions, and so I'm grateful to the, for the fact that you have done that work. Um, I want to recognize and welcome the colleagues who have joined us. We've been joined by Council Members Jumani, Williams, Debbie Rose, Mark Levine, and Margaret Chin. Um, uh, I'm going to ask a couple of questions and then I'll throw it open uh, to colleagues as well. Um, uh, obviously, in your time, you've, there have been a lot of issues that have come before the board, certainly especially around violence and what to do about it, but also around uh, the provision of health care and health services um, around solitary and that set of issues. Um, and I just wonder if you could give a few examples of how you feel your service on the board, you're speaking up when necessary, you're working with your colleagues, um, has helped achieve these goals of sort of making conditions better, of making sure there's good, strong, and transparent oversight. And just give us a sense of what that's looked like in a few examples from the last six years. Sure. Um, when I uh, started on the board, uh, there was a trend of increasing the number of men and women, and, and particularly young people, in solitary confinement. Uh, the, the numbers were, were, were rising, and they were up close to over 600 people uh, who were in solitary confinement, including 25 percent of all of, the, all of the adolescents were in solitary confinement. Uh, I raised this issue to the, to the, to, to, to the board. Uh, um, I, um, 
with, 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 with others, but I, but I think I pr played a leadership role in this, um, uh, put forward a resolution that the board consider a development of a rule to limit the use of solitary confinement. And the first vote was seven to two against. Um, but the next vote was was um, was unanimous in, in, in support, and uh, uh, so I I think I was able to demonstrate some collegiality in that process, and also, um, you know, the, the the change represented City Hall understanding that the time had come to to to, to stop increasing solitary confinement in Rikers Island and to and to address it. And then I worked for for a year as the, one of the chairs of the committees and. And, uh, and then with the, with the new mayor and with the new commissioner, together we, uh, we developed a, uh, a plan which knocks solitary confinement from 600 to 100. So that's, that's one, one area that I, that I think my, my work has been important, although I would say that the, all these things happen in a national context. There's a national notion that we put too many people in jail and that we put too many people in solitary, so it's not an individual. Um, another example. I, just, I'll yes. just interrupt you briefly, though. I mean, you, you, you're, you're humble to, and of course it's true that the broader move for, you know, for confronting and doing something about mass incarceration is a, is a, is a broad movement. Um, I want to give you credit as someone who was calling out these issues well before this was a, a large national well, conversation. Well, I, I, thank, I thank you for that. And, and, and New York coming in early on this made a difference to the rest of the country as well. Um, on, on medical care, you know, I, I first worked on Rikers Island in 1981 as a doctor, and, uh, um, and then I was responsible for, for directing the, 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 the medical care for Montefiore Medical Center. We had a large contract with the, the Department of Health, and that's, we were the major contract in the Department of Health at that time. So when I became onto the board, I, I wanted to uh, use that expertise to, to, to help it. And I think over the past several years, we have um, begun to, we have, developed a regular questionnaire. Basically, we asked the Departments of Correction and the Department of Health to report to us on a monthly basis how many people are scheduled to have appointments, how many people get to their appointments. And this is for specialty care, uh, hospital visits, and mental health care. And this is an area where the city can do a lot better. Uh, we've, by, by establishing these, the, this data, we can track it. Uh, the, the board, uh, and I've been involved in this, I was involved in the development of that, of that, of that project, and I follow it closely. Uh, the board now convenes regular meetings between the Department of Correction and, and Health and Hospitals uh, to improve these numbers. There's, there's unfortunately a great need for improvement, but it's an area where I've used my expertise. And is that uh, responsive? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. And other my colleagues may have uh, want to drill down on some of those issues or some of the others that you address in the in the questions. But um, a couple more questions for me. Um, so first, I know you've seen the press release that the corrections officers yeah, union released, um, which I think members have seen as well. Uh, you know, it's certainly my experience in talking to you over the years that. Um, you know, you're thoughtful about what this looks like from all sides and that you care about the health and safety of corrections officers as well as the health and safety of, of inmates and, and, and folks in the system. Um, but I just want to give you an opportunity, you know, on the record to address the issues that they raise. Yes, the, the, you know, I've been on the board for a long time and I've met many times with, 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 with COBA and uh, I, um, don't, we don't always agree, although I have, uh, and when I've done so, they've, uh, they've thanked me for supporting having adequate numbers of correctional officers in housing units, uh, even if that uh, meant a rearrangement of the budget or of, or, or of departmental priorities. This particular issue that they raised, and, and it's one specific issue, has to do with a particular person who is housed in a special unit on Rikers Island. Uh, in March, a judge in the Bronx ordered uh, this particular person um, to uh, be in indefinite, forever solitary confinement without visits and without recreation. Uh, this, that's wrong. Um, there, he is a very complex individual. He needs to be, he needs to be in a special situation. He, when, he, when he travels, he needs to be accompanied by people who can, can, can control him. But the notion that a, that, and this order by, by the Bronx judge was requested by the Department of Correction. The Department of Correction and, and actually COBA, I believe, also wanted this to happen. The order was specifically requested by the Bronx DA, but the background in, in detail was provided by the Department of Correction. Where I, when I grew up, I just learned that, that the, the rights of those who are most in trouble are the ones that you have to, that you have to defend. And so 
we know that pro prolonged solitary confinement is really dangerous. And now this is a person who is being t told, the department is being told by a judge to keep this person f forever in solitary confinement. In fact, the order says wherever he goes, he should be in solitary confinement without visits and without, with his family and without ever getting out of his cell except for a shower. I think that was, that was excessive and that's, and that's what I raised. And, and just so I'm clear, I mean, I guess this is even from the press release, but w what you did was at a Board of Corrections meeting expressed profound concern about this issue. That's what I did. Okay. I, as I understand it, that's, the, that's what you're supposed to do on the Board of Corrections. So. And I'll just note for, other, for others, um, you know, if, if you want evidence of, of Dr. Cohen's speaking up when he felt it was necessary, when the department or, you know, the administration disagreed, there's plenty of evidence of, of that as well. So it's certainly a, a, a balanced approach to expressing concern and, and paying close attention. So um, my last question, um, though it's certainly a big one, but I feel I'd be remiss if, uh, if I didn't ask about the Lippmann Commission and the proposal to, to close Rikers, as you know, our speaker, uh, you know, called for the creation of that, of that commission, uh, and a lot of us support uh, support that goal and, and work to get there. Um, so I just wonder if you could share your perspective on, on the work to close Rikers. Yes, I, I certainly support the, uh, the, 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 the council um, uh, and all its members and leadership in, in bringing this, this issue um, to, the, to, the, to where, where it's, it's, a, it's an extraordinary act that you all took, and I'm uh, very proud to be in New York, a citizen of New York City, which, which takes this move. I, 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 it's going to be a project. There are a lot of steps that are going to have to be done. I'll, I'll mention the way I see some of the issues. Um, uh, we have to reduce the population. Everybody agrees on that. The number, um, the, our goal on that should be as low as possible. It should, if it, rather than 7,000, it should be 5,000 if we, if we can get there. And I think we probably can because our numbers are still so astronomical compared to the rest of the world, even though New York has done so well compared to itself in, say, Philadelphia, which incarcerates pretty close to the same number of people we do at 20 percent of our size. Um, doing that is going to involve a lot of people. As you all know, um, I would, the police are involved and the district attorneys are involved and the judges are involved, the defense bar is involved, the Department of Correction is involved. Court administration is very involved. It's not ironic that Judge Lippman was in charge, but the court administration can do a lot to to make this uh, to make this better. Um, and uh, all these things uh, result in all, all those parties are part of the project of unnecessary incarceration and prolonged uh, processing of, uh, of arrestees. And I would suggest that the DAs and the judges, um, the, the ADAs and the judges, whenever they have the chance, come out to Rikers Island so they'll see what's going on there and and stimulate them towards, um, towards working harder on this project. Um, bail reform, I won't describe how I would solve it, which is not important, but it's, uh, it's got to be part of it, and, and I know the city is, uh, is working on that, the administration is. I would just caution that um, this often goes towards a mechanical, algorithmic uh, rep uh, approach, um, and it's not that I don't believe in science or mathematics or algorithms, but the, the algorithm that's involved in bail reform should take into account the, the injury, not just, to the, not just the risk of the community, which is important, but the injury that occurs to a person and their family when they're incarcerated on Rikers Island. And I would just add that to, to, the, uh, add that to the algorithmic mix. The current ones that the city is looking at, I believe, don't take that into account. There's got to be a lot of retraining of the, of the staff. You know, just, just bringing the Rikers Island of today to new facilities in, in, in Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, Manhattan, um, is not going to change the, uh, the culture of Rikers Island. And the, the Federal Monitor's report just came out yesterday describing a situation that needs dramatic improvement in terms of behavior uh, by everyone. And uh, so I strongly feel that there has to be um, more training. Um, and there are a lot of new officers being, who are coming in, and you can those, they're easy to reach, although they have to, then they get, you know, get onto Rikers Island. And it is a really, really hard job to be there all day long, day after day, year, year after year. But, um, but I think that uh, training is very important, that specifically it should be done in conjunction with John Jay, that the training is not just about de-escalation techniques or, um, or um, and how to just correctional issues, but there should be a training around um, criminology, anthropology, and these should be real courses. 
and um, sociology and law and psychology, and there should be encouragement and there should be a recognition within the department and, and promotions of getting a getting associate degrees, getting baccalaureate degrees, and, and professionalizing the, 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 the staff as, as, we, as we move forward. This is not to, this, this recognizes that anybody who's been there and worked this hard is not to be, you know, denied those advancements, but going forward, this is this is what what, the, what we hear about when you hear about the, the the prisons in Europe that are so that are that are models. That's the that's the educational basis of those of, the, of those systems. Just a more more you know more highly trained uh, group of people. Make sure the facilities, of course, built close to the courts and transportation. That's critical. ATI is very important. I would I would you know I would not stop any programs that exist, but I would not you know. ATI happened a long, long time ago, and it just built up a lot of people in ATI as all the prisons and jails kept increasing as well. So we have to be very careful that, that, um, that new ATI programs not just increase the number of people who are under, under supervision. And that, um, and that new programs should be developed towards, towards bringing together um, through a restorative justice model, uh, persons who have committed violent acts and those, and those that they have, uh, those that they have um, those that they have, the victims that they that they that they that they've hurt, and and that's that's the direction I think we should be going, and that should be built into the process of thinking about a new kind of, of correction system. Um, drug policy uh, need to have more you know more access to uh, to drug treatment for people leaving Rikers Island. Although I believe H and H and the department are committed to that, um, people should get naltrexone. Um, 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 Narcan, um, naloxone when they leave Rikers Island. The, the department is trying to do that. It's complicated, but um, everybody, there should be really wide access to prevent deaths from opiate overuse and people coming to Rikers Island use drugs and they should be given this when they leave. And uh, people should be given access to a buprenorphine treatment uh, to, to help them um, get off of, you know, to get them off of heroin and there should be careful, and I know this is happening, uh, there should be work between the city and the state so that people can be initiated on buprenorphine when they're in city jails and be continued when they, when, if they have to serve time upstate. Two last things. Um, one is to, we sh I think we should re reduce, I mean, probably eliminate um, incarceration on Rikers Island for misdemeanor crimes. That's just not, that's one way to, to get at it. And, uh, and finally, sorry, could you um, say that again, I had a hard time hearing. For that. misdemeanors, should not be on Rikers Island. We should just uh, figure out another way of taking care of that population. And finally, um, and this is on New York City issues particularly, but it can be in a state. We should elim eliminate uh, or reduce, but eliminate be better. The collateral consequences of incarceration and conviction, access to public housing, access to, 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 to licenses so that people are not forced into a situation when they, they have fewer options than they, that when they need. They begin be way behind once you get off of Rikers Island and to, you know, and to even and when people have served their terms to give them those collateral consequences is wrong. Thank you for that very uh, thorough and, and helpful answer. Obviously, this has become something that's, you know, it's at some levels more, uh, you know, bumper sticker right. than a real thorough. And so it's really right. great to have that, have that detail from you. So thank you. Um, Councilmember Rosenthal has questions and if other colleagues do as well. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Dr. Cohen, for being here. Um, I'm, I was struck uh, I haven't been on the island recently, but I was struck when we were talking to Corizon, who I guess had the um, uh, contract mm -hmm. to provide doctors on island, you know, before, and I guess now it's back at H&H. H right. yes. um, hearing the stories about what the medical professionals saw happening before them and how limited they were to doing anything about it. And it struck me at that time that the tension within Rikers or any prison is between the need for security and, and that the notion of health is not in the mission necessarily of the Department of Corrections. I was wondering from all your experience being on island, being you know, a professional on the board, if you see a route to uh, how those two things can 
how the Board of Correction, how the Department of Corrections could expand its mission to include the help. People always say this, but that is a really good question. I've spent uh, many, many years thinking about that and uh, working on it. Um, it is a contra it's, it's a contradiction. I mean, one is there for security, the other is there for compassion in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a good world. And uh, they, uh, they often con con conflict. Every time someone, if someone has the right to, to request medical care, then they can ask to be moved, right? And then they, in order to get medical care, they have to be taken from one place to another. It's, it's one of the only things you can do that, you can, you can, that, a, that a person can ask saying, please do this. And there's a constitutional right um, you know, to do that. So that's, so, so that's one thing. Um, you can create rules, policies and procedures by the department and, and, the, and, and the health things which will accommodate every issue and they won't. Conflicts will arise and in my mind they should arise because there are fundamental contradictions in, in this thing and if no conflicts are arising it means that people aren't really doing their job because there will be times when medical has to say this is not working, we have to do this. Now in the end, corrections always trumps you know, in the most extreme situation. It's their, it's the, it's their space. And, and, and the medical care is working within it. But uh, the things that you can do, and what New York City has done better at some times than at others, is to fundamentally say that the, that, the, that the location of the healthcare services are not in the Department of Correction. So it's been historically in the Department of Health and in the Department of Health and Mental Health, now through a sleight of hand. <laughs> it's in the health and hospitals. I don't think the charter hasn't been changed, so it's really under health department, but it's in there. Um, some, what's important to, to preserve the balance that you're concerned about tipping, I'd say, I'd say, is to support the autonomy of the health care provider. So uh, to, when, when the Department of Correction puts pressure on City Hall, for example, to, uh, to control, you know, to limit the um, interest of the, the, the concerns of the health care provider in terms of these conflicts, then that's a problem. Um, historically, I think New York's been very good at that. Um, you know, state, New York State, the health care is run by the correctional department, not by the health department. Most jails are run, health care is run by jails. So having an independent, autonomous health care provider is the general strategy that I would recommend toward, toward, towards doing that. New York has it in principle. It varies depending upon the Department of Correction and the Department of Health or Health and Hospitals as to how they, how they look at it. Um, and uh, it's something that will always be a conflict and just has to be. And now the department, it's, it's hard for the Board of Correction to monitor that in detail because it's a gigantic system. But, um, but I think we have an obligation to assure that when there are, when conflicts come to our attention and that people know they can bring conflicts to our attention, that, that we are engaged to, to defend, to engage in that conflict uh, on behalf of our, of, of our mission. And I tell you, we do that all the time. I mean, I was on Rikers Island two weeks ago where there was a person who didn't, who shouldn't have been there. Should have been at Bellevue. He's at Bellevue now. But, but, but we got involved in, in that process to make that happen, so. What protections do the medical profession, professionals have on island in terms of security if they speak out or try to get help for uh, inmates? Well, when, when I ran the, the program, th th these conflicts, you know, this is a long time ago, in the 80s, um, uh, I had the support of an organization, you know, I mean, I, I was a contract with the Department of Health. I worked for Montefiore Medical Center, and, and when those issues came up, we worked, I worked directly with the Department of Health and sometimes politically, you know, if that was, if that, if that was necessary. Uh, right now, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, you're relying a lot on the professionalism of the medical staff to speak up when, um, when they're unable to do their, when able to do their job. Um, there has been historically some terrific medical leadership within the Department of Health and Mental Health and Health and Hospitals that has worked toward, toward, towards that. At, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a lecture called Dual Loyalty, 
you know, I mean, it's, it's you know, I mean, that, that should be given to every health practitioner on Rikers Island, which, un, which you explain to them, and there's lots of information, you know, lots of examples about this. Of, you're working in an institution that has this priority, but your priority as a health professional is that. These conf conflicts are going to arise. What's the best way to, to deal with them? So. How do you measure whether or not the city is funding the contract, uh, whether it's with Montefiore, Corizon, H&H, &H, whether or not the city is funding a sufficient amount of uh, medical care? Well, the board does not do the um, regular quality assurance. The Department of uh, Health and Hospitals does that right now, although there is a growing um, capacity within the Department of Correction, which, uh, which looks at health healthcare, healthcare issues. I'm not, um, it's hard for me to think that there's not enough money in the budget right now because the population is so much lower than it was before, and I don't have any evidence epidemiologically that the Persons are so much sicker. They may be more violent. You know, they're, you know, you know. As we go through these other processes of bail reform, you're going to end up with a different group of people on on, on Rikers Island. But in terms of their health care status, I I don't know. I mean, you would, you would. I mean, there are basic things, which is there have to be coverage of doctors, a certain number of doctors and nurses every shift and every in every facility. Um, you'd look at number of times that sta that that uh, shifts were not filled. You'd hear about uh, no one's showed up for, you know, there's no staff there for sick call. Um, but, uh, I mean, I know, actually know how to do this, um, you know, and because, I've, because I've, I've done that, you know, professionally. I mean, I, I think you want to rely on, this, on the Health and Hospitals Corporation to defend itself here, although obviously it's part of a larger budget process in terms of wh where its priorities are right, right, right now. I personally would not have put the, the health services into the health and hospitals because it's a tiny little part of a gigantic organization that is in crisis. And so I wouldn't have taken this money right now and, and given it, you know, and I wouldn't have taken this program and put it there because it, it doesn't matter as much to health and hospitals as it mattered to the Department of Health just because of the size. And the Department of Health is not in the crisis that health and hospitals are the financial delegates. Uh, when was that change made? That was done, I guess, a, about a year and a half ago. Did you argue against it at the I time? I did. I did, but I wasn't. I didn't. I did. Was Stan the Brezhnev the? Stan was at was at health and was at uh, was at PLC? was at, he was on the board at that at that at that time. I mean, I was not I was not at the meetings at City Hall, but I was but I was informed about them. And it's a tough it was a tough it's a tough situation. Everybody wanted to get rid of Corizon, and that was an important thing to do, I believe. Um, and then the problem was, you know, and then. DOHMH doesn't provide care. That's sort of not what it does right now. So that was a difficult problem. There was an alternative proposed to, uh, um, I'm sure this is too much detail. I apologize for taking up all the time, but your question. Um, there was a proposal to set up a 501c3 uh, corporation, which would, which would be chaired by the departments of health and HRA and H&H &H and the, you know, the mayor's office and would run, the, would run the medical care as a smaller, responsive organization um, that would have some autonomy. Um, understand, you know, that's not what happened. I understand the arguments. You, don't, you know, the, if I were running the city, I would want to have more direct control over things than have another board to go through. But Do you was... think that the budget for the contract, whether it be through Corizon or an affiliate or directly, uh, has gone in tandem with the population at Rikers? I'm sorry. Has it? has it run in tandem with the population at Rikers? In other words, is it overfunded now, given the number of people on, on the island? You know, I don't know if it's overfunded. There are a lot more facilities than there were at other, at, at, at other points, and um, there, is a, there is more need for mental health services, and there are court orders around mental health services. So I, I don't have a sense that it's underfunded right now. I, I would not say that it's overfunded, although I b believe, I mean, I've asked this question of several people recently, that the, that the budget is pretty much at the same level it's been for two years and the population has gone down a bunch over that period. And I believe it's actually been more than several years. So I, I, I think that there probably is, I have not heard a complaint of inadequate, uh, inadequate funding.
And then lastly, your record is so completely directed to being a member of the Board of Corrections. Are there other people like you out there? <laughs> sure, I'm sure there. I'm sure a lot. You actually have. I mean, the city, uh, the mayor appointed Dr. Stephen Safier, the president of Montefiore, who also ran uh, Rikers Island Health Service. Oh. He's on the board of correction. So, so he and you are the same person. <laughs> yeah, we're we're, co we're good colleagues. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, uh, in terms of my expertise, I mean, there's a, you're talking about on the board now, or who should yeah, be, or should be, could be. Oh, well, I mean, you know, Stanley Richards, one of your appointments is a, is a, you know, someone I've worked with for many, many years. As I mentioned, I was on the, as I was, I was on the Fortune board. I mean, I, I would like to be reappointed, so I don't want to suggest you replace me with someone else right now. But, um, but I think, uh, you know, um, that uh, the expertise of someone who has spent time as, a, as a, you know, living on Rikers Island would be, you know, is very important. And, that, you know, that, that, would, that would be... That would be the direction I would go, um, you know, in terms of and, if, and whatever other experience they could, that person could bring to it. Thank you for your time. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. And you know, I, 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 I alluded to this before, but I, you know, I, I want to just. This, it, it doesn't seem like this should have been the first council that appointed a former prisoner to the Board of Corrections, but it was, and you know, yes. that's at least a step in the right in the right direction. So it's um, Councilmember Williams. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Doctor, for, <clears throat> for your testimony. And of course, a shout out to Stanley again. And I, I concur, it shouldn't have been the first time. And, um, I think it's, uh, is it Glenn Martin that always says, those who are closest to the problem also have the solutions or some variation of that. And for some reason, it's highly progressive and unique to make sure those peoples are in places where their voices are heard. But I'm, I'm glad we were able to do that. And I only have a couple of questions. I think it's been really fleshed out where you are, and I think that's a very good place to be, so I thank you for that. But I was just reading the press release of COBA. Is anybody from COBA going to be testifying? I don't see anyone here. Is anybody from COBA going to be testifying? <laughs> Which is frustrating, because there was one thing that concerned me, and I, from all of the sounds, um, Mr. Sidbury is probably not the you know, nicest person in the world, and probably someone that sh should be protected from other folks, and perhaps himself, I, I don't know. but. but it, it, they charge you with being an outspoken voice for the welfare of the most violent inmates incarcerated in the Department of Correction, which sounded to me as a very odd thing to charge somebody with because we're supposed to be responsible for everybody, including the most violent inmates incarcerated in the Department of Correction. So I, I just wish Cobo was here. I want to just talk to them about it. It just seems like an odd space to be coming from because they should also be responsible for the welfare of the most violent. So it's just a weird thing. I don't know if you want to comment on that particular oh, I, charge. I, 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 I agree with you, uh, Cal Councilman. It's, uh, it was, it was sort of, this was stated yesterday at our, at our board meeting, and I was a little, I was su su surprised. Because, um, uh, of course, it is our responsibility to defend those who are most in, uh, most in need. I mean, he's a very difficult person, and I'm not, and I, I did, was not at all defending anything that he did. And uh, I just, I just uh, thought we, we've gotten, you know, we've cut down the sentences for solitary confinement. We've set up special conditions where, you, where for, for particular people, you can be continued in solitary confinement, but generally that you're that, that not. And, and there are even there are rules in New York State about visiting for, uh, for, for prisoners and the notion that you condemn someone forever to solitary. That, and that's what this, that's what this judge, judge ordered. I don't know if the judge knew what he was doing, um, but he, um, but that was what the DA asked for, and that's what the department asked for, and and it's what Koba asked for, also. So I, I would be happy to answer any particular questions that they have of me. But um, I, but I agree with you. This was, a, I think, that's our job to do. What I just want were. to put on record. I think this is a highly, highly weird charge, um, because it seems like it's their charge also. So I, I mean, charging the two different terms, but um, it does just seem weird to me. But also, of course. I always want to make sure that um, correction officers' voices are heard and their concerns are addressed. Uh, they, not all of them may, may believe me, but um, it, it's important because they work there. Um, I don't, and they go there every single day. And I knew, though, based on things that I've heard from them and pictures, it is not the nicest place to be, and it's, um, it's dangerous. Um, it's probably not the nicest place to be for the prisoners as well. So uh, what about the concerns of 
taking away solitary, solitary confinement as taking away one of the things that they say stops the behavior. Have you seen any connections between solitary confinement and stoppage of behaviors, other things that we can do that's besides that? I, I know uh, the mental damage that it does, but I, I just want to have an opportunity to flesh that out in your mind. Well, just in, in general, I mean, I, um, it, I just want to restate what you did, which is really true. Walking, you know, through down the halls of Rikers Island and working in those 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 housing areas day after day, year after year after year, is a incredibly difficult job, and uh, and I, re I I respect that. It doesn't excuse any, you know, it doesn't excuse um, some of the the violence that is characteristic of, Ry of, Ry of Rikers Island. Um, I think that uh, there's no evidence that uh, that the when there was more solitary confinement on Rikers Island that it was a, that it was a safer place. Uh, the harm is dramatic that 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 that, 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 that happens, and uh, you know, and, and all over the country, this is the this is what, what's going forward right now. Even people who are in solitary should have hours out of their cell. So they can spend more time because you, you you spend a lot of time in solitary, then you're released out into the street, then you're really a danger to uh, to to, uh, to other people. So I understand, you know, that that a man like this person that we're talking about is extremely um, scary, and not scary in, a, in a, like in a in a, in a horror movie. I mean, he is a very he has done lots of really violent things and threatened to do to do to do to do more. And uh, he should be kept in a very, very safe place, but he should get out into the yard. He should have a chance to have visits under a very controlled si si situation. And uh, these basic, you know, in a situation for someone who's as complex as him, it's going to take more work on the, Depart of the Department of Correction, more support in terms of, of, of officers. Um, but the more he is, I, you know, I, I know, I've known him for a long time, this person, and when he is in the, the more time that, that he can spend outside of a cell, the less violent I believe he's going to be. I don't think he should be. He can't be in general population, but he should not be locked up 24 hours a day. And uh, so, it has effect of the psychological effect can make them more violent as opposed to. I, I think that's right. Uh, and just lastly, in, in the fantasy world, <laughs> obviously my, my contention has been that the, the prison system in general, Rikers in particular, it's set up to make human beings act unlike human beings and. And so these things that, that occur and the violence is not, I mean, if you did a social experiment and set people up like that, it's gonna happen. And so in a dream world, what should a prison look like to prevent that kind of inhumanity from being so pervasive? And this, I mean, this include, I mean, the, the corrections officers have a job to do, but the way the whole thing functions, it's, it's, it, it, it's geared toward this yeah. inhumane place. Yeah, I think for, for a long time, uh, Everybody's approach to Rikers Island, the people who work there, the people who are who are who are in prison there, is is that you you get through the the day by proving that you're strong enough to do that, and it's a and 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 violence is encouraged at every level uh, as a way of demonstrating your your force is encouraged as a way of demonstrating your 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 where you are at within this within the system. Uh, and that's really bad, and it results in in continued levels of, of, of violence and um, uh, federal court orders. And this is the, this is not the, this is the second time that a federal court has come, has come in here. I think that um, you know the other places that do it better do it better. Um, you have more, you have fewer people in a facility. Uh, I mean, to go back to the beginning, obviously, there are all kinds of things about New York which could be better in terms of why people end up on, 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 Ry on Rikers Island, and then it can go back to all education and juvenile law. And, but I think that, um, I'll give you an example. I walked into the jail in Copenhagen a few years ago in Denmark, and the first thing that someone said to me is that everybody who's here represents a failure, a social failure on the part of the society. So, so I think you have um, smaller facilities, fewer people in them, more correction officers who are better trained, and a design that gives people as much time out of cells as they can, as they can tolerate, that gives them training if that's possible. All the things that you would imagine, um, some people are not going to work. There are some people who are just going to have to be in jail, and that's. I do have a question because I've, I've seen a lot of places. Uh, I know Demac was one. There was a few places I saw where the jails work 
much better. They, they, well, this is not a Department of Corrections. So the other places I've seen that it works actually is trying to correct something. This, ours is more based on punitive and, and punishment. But in a lot of those places, the one thing I've seen in some of those countries is that they, they're monolithic. So would some of the, would it work in a society that's not as monolithic? And I, I think that is a really, that, that, that I, I ask myself, you know, what are the reasons for mass incarceration in this country and what are the reasons for all the violence that occurs? And I don't have one answer. But here are the element, you know. But but it is absolutely the case that 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 the heterogeneity of this society is makes it worse in terms of jails and prisons because it just allow because it allows people to act in ways that they act, and we've watched them act, and it's hard to do that if the chances are that someone who's going to be in prison is your cousin or your brother or your sister rather than it's an other some of that you don't know. So I, so I think that, you know, even though it's wonderful that we have all kinds of people in this country, there are a lot, and not just a heterogen, you know, a, a homogeneous population, I think, um, it does create conflict. So what are the, what are the issues that, that give rise to it? You, you know better than I do. It has to do with slavery. It has to do with racism. It has to do with economics. It has to do with, um, with class, class, class differences. Um, and so it, we, we do have a much more difficult problem than, than other countries. But um, we didn't have mass incarceration up until 76, so we, and so we should be able to get back down a lot. I, I'm just I'm not really that hopeful, but I work, work on it every day to make it better. Well, thank you very much for the work that you're doing. I'm um, looking forward for Rikers to be closed, uh, hopefully sooner than 10 years, uh, and continue <laughs> the great work that we're doing uh, on uh, the mass incarceration issue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank, thank you, Councilmember uh, Williams. And I'll just note for the record on this question of sort of different perspectives on the board that there is a member of the board, James Perino, who spent uh, quite a lot of years uh, working in the Department of Corrections and was in many of these facilities. So yeah. the goal of making sure the board brings a variety of there, perspectives there, to there, the there are two, table. There, there, two. And there's another warden um, uh, also also on the board uh, right right now. So, so that's not that's a you know we, we, no. yeah, right. we've got a. So there, there, are two, there, are two, there are two men whose careers were as wardens. And Thank you. Councilmember Rose, to close us out. Thank you. Um, Dr. Cohen, uh, it must be very difficult to be a progressive in a situation that's oppressive and regressive. Um, and so I'm, I'm intrigued by uh, why you would like to be reappointed um, for another you know, term. Um, and I'm trying to understand the construct of the, the board in terms of uh, do you have direct oversight? Um, do you initiate policy? How much input do you have? And, you know, um, what is your frustration level? <laughs> Don't ask my children that. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, it is for me. It's an honor, you know, to do it, and I work with, you know, some terrific with terrific colleagues, and uh, so it's. I mean, it. I've been doing this a long time. Now a lot of people are, care about it a lot more. So in fact, it's um, it's more, you know, it's more. So I get a lot more support. You know, I mean, my friends had to put up with my discussions about prisons and jails for, for 30 <laughs> years, but, but, but now they're doing it too. So, um, so the board, we make, we, I mean, it's, it's an interesting organization. It's a, it's a policy-making organization. It's a legislative organization. If, if, not, if, if the majority of nine of us get together after, a, after the, a CAPA process occurs, we make rules that, that, that bind the Department of, of, of Correction. Can we enforce those rules? That's a little complicated because they're there and we're just, you know, here. And, um, you know, can our rules be used by others to keep, you know, it, keep it in line? For example, we ruled that, that you could not have closed custody. Closed custody was something that, that was set up by the department after they closed down the transgender housing unit under a previous administration. Then the people, then transgender um, uh, women were put into General protective custody, but they were put in protective custody where they were really in solitary confinement. So the board ruled that you can't have closed custody. The department continued with closed custody. Legal Aid Society, also funded by the city of New York, sued um, based upon our rule. And in state, you know, in Article 78, I guess, proceeding, I'm not a lawyer, but uh, I think in Article 78, and the court ruled that the department was bound by our rules and the department closed down closed custody. 
Um, when we said, you know, we made a rule saying you can't have been solitary more than 30 days and modify that to no, no more than 60 if you're, if you're a, uh, if, it's an, if it's a very serious injury directed, you know, against a correctional officer, that happened. So, so we, we, we are a legislative uh, group. When we find problems, um, we use all kinds of things to, 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 to fix them. I mean, for example, yesterday we, you know, we read a rule saying the department has to screen everyone for, the, for their risk of sexual abuse or the risk that they will victimize someone else. And the department didn't, do, didn't develop the screening tool for that. So uh, we talked with them and they, said give it you know and they asked us to excuse them and give them a variance and it was the board's feeling that they could have done this if they <laughs> if they had wanted to and we should not reward this with a variance but actually we said this is a violation and tell us in two weeks what your plan is to to to, to fix it and tell us every month what you've done and also if you don't have a computerized system to do it do the screening anyway because this is very important for safety so on our best days <laughs> you know that's what that's what that's what we do. Um, mm -hmm. We issue reports. Um, I think I think we make it a uh, I think we make it a better place. And in some situations, if I were the head of the Department of Correction, I would use the board mm -hmm. <laughs> to to, uh -huh. to to yell at me for things that I wanted to change that I couldn't get someone else to change. What is the um, impediment to actually um, the follow through of of the recommendations or even I guess the policy that you write? What are the impediments in terms of actually accomplishing them? Well, generally, when we write new policies, they're, they're, they're followed. I um, mean, the issue is that there, there, we, there are a number of rules that we have, and some of, them are, some of them are violated. So, for example, there is a facility on Rikers Island where people are routinely denied access to um, uh, contact visits and legal, you know, and access to, 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 to law library and to congregate religious services. It's a complex issue. The department is in, we say they're in violation of our rules. They keep saying that they're going to fix it, but they haven't fixed it yet. So, um, but we have not, to, you know, we potentially is could bring. Is it rules? Is it shortage of staff? Is it lack of money? What? No, no I think these are complicated. These are, these are complicated situations where, where, um, uh, where there has to be, they require more work on their part to, to meet to meet our rules and um, more due process, people can just be brought to this place without a reason. There's a reason, but there's no official reason. They're not given the chance to appeal. Uh, so, you no, know, I think it's uh, the department. Departments of correction like to run themselves. They don't like to be interfered with by outside groups. So, they, you know, the board is respected generally, but there are times when they don't listen to us. Then it becomes a operational and a political process to, to try to... Um, and there is a process that then can be followed to make sure that the recommendations are instituted? Well, I think the board has done a lot of great things, but it is made up of nine people, and uh, yet you need five of them to sort of pass a rule or something, and, uh, and if you were, say, say, say the department was doing something that four of the board members thought was really wrong and was really a problem, but five of the board members didn't really agree with that, and the mayor didn't agree with it, or, or the city, you know, I mean, they're, they're, it's, it's, it's an independent organization, but it is also, um, but these are big institutions, and, and uh, I don't think we should be there saying, do this, do this, do that. It's, that, that, would be, that would be impossible for the department to function if the board could just run around and say, change this, change that. Um, I think we're, we're, we're effective. We should try to be more effective, but uh, I hope that's responsive. Are you um, uh, in agreement with the proposed changes to close Rikers Island, and um, do you think we're moving in the right direction? Oh, I'm very much, I've been, yes, I'm very much in, uh, in, in, Support of the uh, of the commission of the you know and, and of the leadership of the city council in doing that and I, um, I, I may have spoken a little bit before you, you came in on that but I um, it's going to be uh, I'm very proud to live in New York City where 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 someone could run for mayor on the the, the platform of closing down Rikers Island right now and expect to win uh, it's a it's a so yes close it down decrease the population there are too many people in jail. Fix the systems um, that, that keep them there too long. Um, train, the, train the staff. 
uh, so that we're not just moving the culture of Rikers Island onto borough facilities, um, make them clean, have their be adequate, uh, train officers uh, at a higher level than they're currently than they're currently trained. Um, try to model behavior of other of other institutions outside of this country, which have have a better approach, I think, to, to correctional practice. And I just want to say I, I was really glad to see that you um, have a holistic approach, approach that you're looking at the, the person who's incarcerated, you know, as an individual um, who has rights to, you know, medical um, care. I, I was really disturbed by the COBA's um, statement. I mean, by nature, you're a doctor. You're supposed to. Um, help people and, and care about their general welfare. And so um, uh, I found it a, a little distressing. My father was a correction officer, and um, I never heard him espouse anything that other than that everybody had the right to, you know, be cared for. Um, and so um, I, I'm, I'm proud to hear that you're looking at not only the prisons, but um, the safety of, of the staff, and, and especially the medical staff. I had a friend who, who was a doctor who worked at Rikers Island um, many years ago, and, um, and that was an issue for the medical staff, was their safety. So um, I, I hope that you're looking at making sure that the medical staff also is, is protected. It's very important. We will, we will do thank that. you. Thank you, Councilmember Rose. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Cohen, for this uh, good and thorough hearing. We'll, uh, we have no one else signed up to testify, so we will uh, close the hearing at this point. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we don't vote on the, uh, the day of the sure. first meeting of this committee, giving an opportunity for other members to review the testimony. Um, if we have any additional questions, we'll, we'll come back to you, but uh, otherwise we will uh, vote next week, the 17th, the day of our stated meeting. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much.